So today we have two really special guests, Gavin Heffernan and Haroon Mahmoudinovich. Gavin and Haroon have traveled all across North America to capture the beauty of the night sky, from picturesque Yosemite National Park in California to the waters over Acadia National Park in Maine. These guys have inspired me personally to work to protect our one big night sky. Their amazing work has been featured by the BBC, Yahoo News, and the Lonely Planet, just to name a few. So welcome, guys. Hi there. Thanks for having us. We're glad Hi. you're here. So I understand you put together a short video for us all to watch together. So we'll pull yep. that into the screen here in a second. And if you're watching along on Facebook or YouTube, um, shoot us a message. Let us know where you're watching from. And if you have questions um, from Gav about Gavin and Haroon's adventures or their photography or anything that comes up while you're watching the video, post them in the comments and we'll come back after the video plays and ask these guys your comments. So take it away. Greetings IDA. My name is Gavin and I'm here with Haroon and we're part of the Sky Glow Project, which is an initiative we started a few years ago to try and help to protect the endangered night sky. And so we went all across the continent shooting some of the best dark sky locations with long exposure photography and time lapses. And that was sort of our way of trying to bring awareness to the problem and to the issues at hand. So now, while we're all kind of under the lockdown blues, we thought it might be fitting to sort of show three of our videos to you. And hopefully this can help kind of brighten up your day a bit and maybe get a little bit of education in there as well. When we launched the project, we wanted to have one sort of a shocking, jarring, uh, interesting, however you want to put it, video that uh, opens the project. And we had heard this story, which is that back in 1994 in Los Angeles and in Southern California, there was a huge earthquake. Some of you may remember called the Northridge earthquake. And it knocked out the power grid of LA. And when it did that, a lot of people in the middle of the night ran out on the street as this was happening. And they looked up and what do you think they saw? They saw a bunch of stars for the first time. So they flooded the uh, 911 phone calls, for example, with complaints about the weird stuff in the sky. And they weren't sure if that's what caused the earthquake maybe or something like that. So we want to do a video which would be a take on that. So as you saw there, there was like a transition between light polluted New York and uh, stars above New York. And that is uh, what we decided to do in this coming video, which is to splice the these beautiful night skies of, New, of uh, Death Valley and of Grand Canyon over Los Angeles to give you a sense of what people in LA would have been seeing back in 1994. Uh, so let's take a look at that video and when we come back, we'll talk more.
So, as you can see, that's not actually what the stars are like over Los Angeles, even today when the skies are probably more clear than they've been in 30 or 40 years. But we wanted to really shock you, as Haroon said. We wanted to try to show you what things could be like if some of the right changes were made. And so for the project as a whole, what we did is we sort of treated things a little bit like a time machine. And so while as this shows you the modern day life, what we did was went all the way back to the beginning, to the sort of ancestral times when the stars were so integral to society that they played a major part in our myths, in the way people lived and worked, and in the ancient dwellings that we'll see in this next video. And for this one, what we did is we went to all kinds of incredible ancestral sites in Arizona, New Mexico, and really looking at sort of the native perspective on the, on the stars and how it influenced all the different spheres of daily life. So a lot of those uh, petroglyphs and other sorts of sites uh, you saw in a previous video, uh, the references to, to celestial objects could be things like 13 moons, which was in one of the shots, or the sun, or certain constellations. Um, so this sort of influence of celestial observation was huge in both religion and science. And what you see in the back of me here is uh, one of the most important um, astronomy sites in the world, which is in Mauna Kea and the Big Island of Hawaii but also the uh, mountain itself, which is the third highest mountain in all of the solar system, little known fact. Um, 
is actually a sacred mountain to Native Hawaiians who, of course, encountered Hawaii because they practiced um, celestial navigation. They used stars in order to get uh, uh, these sailing ships across the ocean and they eventually landed in, among many other islands, Hawaii. So it was very important to them culturally. And also then, of course, making its way through sciences, observation of the night sky and, and uh, astronomy, of course, is one of the most obvious ones, but m much of science was impacted uh, by observation of the night sky, at least the, the imagination that arose out of the observation of the night sky uh, gave birth to a lot of sciences and religions. So um, also we wanted to, um, among uh, uh, other things in, in this project, also address the impacts of light pollution. So not just the importance of the night sky, but what does the light pollution do? So one of the videos that we did is we ventured to Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which is uh, unique for various reasons, but one of, one of them is that it has world's only, to my knowledge, national park reserve for fireflies, which is a place to protect an animal uh, from light pollution. And um, I don't know how many people know, but fireflies are highly impacted. In fact, about 90% of their habitat is decreased because they need the dark in order to mate. And because we've shown our lights everywhere, a lot of the, uh, what used to be traditional habitats of fireflies have disappeared. So now you can, in this video, look at a place where we as humans have worked to preserve. Okay, so there you really see some of the most amazing firefly habitats left. And it's really not just insects that are affected. It's humans, it's fish, plants, animals, every living thing that is meant to be designed with a night and a day that suddenly gets turned out of balance when there is no longer any night. And so it's really just kind of the tip of the iceberg. This is just sort of three quick videos we wanted to show you. We've got about 40 or 50 that are available. If you go to our website, skyglowproject.com, we also have the book, which really sort of lays out a lot of the exciting things we discovered, as well as 
great essays and educational pieces among the pictures. So if you're feeling cooped up and cabin fevered, feel free to check all that stuff out. But thank you to the IDA for giving us a chance to talk to everybody there and for your support on this project and for everything you do to help the night sky. And it's important for everybody to help sign up and try to, to join the organization and look for the little things you can do to help make a difference. Because now more than ever, we really need to work together to try to help the planet and to be more ecologically accountable. Thank you so much for those great videos and nice calming moment. We got a message on Facebook from Nicole. It says the videos were calming her soul. So thank you for the incredible shots and thanks for being here today and sharing them. Yeah. That's great to hear. Yeah, that's what we aim for, at least. Uh, that the whole plan was to sort of try to use these videos as a way to kind of uh, lure you into the educational side of this. So for us, we sort of talked about it kind of like putting the medicine inside the candy. So uh, we use the skills we have. We're not really scientists or biologists or anything. We kind of took the artist perspective and tried to use that to at least just get people thinking about it and try to get people aware of it. Yeah, yeah. well, it's been really effective. We've, as um, an organization, IDA has certainly benefited from your work and your artistry and all of the outreach that you've done, so thanks. Hey, Harun, I'm gonna have you unmute your um, mic, and I have a question for both of you about, um, where, how did you come up with the name Skyglow for your project? Um. Yeah, I think we were looking for different, um, easy to remember, let's say catchy names that we could, that, you know, people can remember based off this project. And one of the terms, uh, one of the ways we referred to light pollution is sky glow, but it sounded a lot better than light pollution to us as, you know, mm -hmm. as, as, as term. So we did that and it, it was interesting because <clears throat> when you hear sky glow, it, it brings up a question, what are you talking about? So it, it just, that word carries with it a question. So it was a good fit for us and it was one short, really clear word um, that, can, that can be understood around the world, um, you know, well. And it's, uh, I think this is a, the whole light pollution area is very science heavy area and that seemed like a very user friendly sort of term for what's usually a very uh, deeper science discussion. Mm. Someone, a friend of mine said it sounded like a James Bond movie, so we figured that that, that helped as well. And yep. just wanted to give it a little drama. And uh, Can we lobby Can we lobby Hollywood to, to eventually do have a Sky Glow James right. Bond? <laughs> That sounds like a great a great title for a James Bond movie. I'd watch it for sure. It was close. Skyfall, Sky <laughs> Glow. So, yeah. I just missed it. Right. <laughs> great. So um I you know, I was watching your video earlier today and thinking about um the the clips from the ancient dwellings in Arizona and New Mexico and really bringing in that native perspective that you talked about, Haroon. And I I have a question, you know, we had um, Vivian White from the NASA Night Sky Network here on earlier today, and she was here talking about the stories of the constellations and the stories of our skies and how different, different cultures have different perspectives and how um, we all get to learn from each other from those perspectives. We learn who we are as, as humanity and we also learn about other cultures. And I know you've been invited into some really, really sacred spaces. And I thought maybe you could take a few minutes just talking us through how you approach those spaces and how you bring that reverence to um, those sacred spaces that you're photographing. I can let Gavin start. He was a bandolier with me on that video as well. Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's one of those things where you, because a lot of the times where we go to these locations, there's nobody else around as well. So you really can kind of just close your eyes and imagine what things really would have been like thousands of years ago. And I think at Bandelier especially, that was one where we really were kind of walking around and just it, you could really sort of feel the experience of, of how important the sky was and just every little dwelling and every little structure that was set up was all sort of strategically placed with the night sky in mind. And mm -hmm. so 
for us, it was kind of like the opposite of what we had experienced at the beginning of the project with that LA video you see where the sky is kind of an afterthought. And here, everything was designed entirely with the native night sky in mind. And so that was kind of interesting. Uh, we, we also had a, one of these, one of the locations we're at, which will remain unnamed, but it was sort of a sacred Native American one. And we actually had an event where one of our tripods just magically got knocked over, even though there was no wind and nothing, you know, it was completely still night. And this has never happened to us in the history of tornadoes and hurricanes and anything. And the thing right in front of our eyes, the, the whole tripod and the camera just went knocked over. So we kind of decided that was a sign to maybe move on to a, a different spot and to move forward. But, but I mean, at the end of the day, we really just sort of really try to treat it with a lot of respect and uh, you know, to us it's just sort of a magical place and we really try to approach it that way and just you know, try to leave the place better than when we found it. And uh, in a broad sense, that's kind of how we approach it, I guess. Oh. Yeah, and it, it's, the good news is that a lot of these ancient sites, um, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are still in good night sky areas. They're often uh, national park adjacent or parts of national parks of public lands. <clears throat> so uh, the good news is if you can get in, and it's really hard to get in at night because they don't want visitors vandalizing mm -hmm. many of these places. So they involve a lot of red tape. They involve a lot of applications to get access to places, and they involve often somebody accompanying you that's a ranger or a, or a native in some cases if it's on a reservation. Um, so uh, that, that's the good news. If you can get to one of those places, you actually get to see it often in a very pristine form, like it would have been, or close and uh, like it would have been for um, Native Americans, um, you know, five, six hundred years ago, as close as we can get anyway. Um, and if you go as far as Alaska <clears throat> and you're up there in the winter, something like Denali, there's almost no light in the horizon anywhere. So it is very, very dark. Um, so that, that's the good news, I guess. Uh, there's lots of negatives uh, in many of these situations. Often when we go to places, we find that there's too much light. Even in where we thought it was very dark, there's just too much light in the horizon. There's always light you can notice. There's these domes. They're like little light mountains, which you can see across the horizon. You can start guessing which towns they're coming from. And sometimes you come to realize it's a town 300, 400 miles away, and you're still seeing the light domes. Uh -huh. So, uh, but these places, these... <clears throat> What's a lot of these sacred places, like a Mount Akea, it's very, very dark in there because the clouds obscure the, the light pollution. Uh, they block it from coming up to 14,000 feet. Yeah, what happens is with us, because we shoot these with very long exposure photography, so each photo, we often leave the shutter open for 25, 30 seconds. So even distant light hundreds of miles away from these towns becomes really magnified in the photography. So you have to kind of get really strategic about which direction you're looking in. And that's kind of what really got us started on this whole journey to begin with, was just shooting night sky stuff and having to keep going further and further out of the city to find these places. And so we started to ask ourselves why and what the hell is this problem? And, and that's sort of what kind of brought us into some awareness about it was really just the initial obstacle. But fortunately we were based in Los Angeles, so we were able to find some great places like Death Valley and Joshua Tree and places where there still was that protected night sky. But it really got us thinking about what is this and, and how do we maybe do something about it. Uh -huh. Uh, Stella on Facebook is asking for tips for location scouting for great uh, astrophotography shots. And I'll add to that question, what makes a great night sky image? Haroon, you, you go first, I'll go second. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll try, to, I'll do the first um, a question first, I guess there's two questions. So one of the ways you can scout is you can look at light pollution maps. Um, there's websites which, you, if you search light pollution maps, there's websites which will show you uh, with the gradations. Basically, they'll give you an estimate of how much light pollution there is ba based on certain amount of data. Uh, those things change because LED retrofits have shifted that map a little bit, and they keep shifting it very quickly uh, because we're changing to LEDs, and that does have, in many cases, larger impact on light pollution. So you'll see some places that looked a lot darker on a map a while ago and now they're too bright uh, comparatively. 
Um, so you would look at a map and that would give you a bit of a sense. So maybe you look at a couple of different light pollution maps and uh, try to find that place maybe that you're thinking of and see what kind of uh, light pollution situation is happening there. Uh, secondly, you want to think about what are good or interesting foregrounds because <clears throat> you try to tell a little story. And stories can be, in our case, obviously with that video, you would go to these ancient sites and you would shoot them maybe the way to get a sense of the way things used to be a while ago. Uh, you may also go into places where you want to have the foregrounds, which like cities, you know, which suggest, you know, presence of light. So you want to see the light, night sky is obscured because of too much light. So each of the things tells a little different story. So you want to pick a foreground that tells some kind of a story. Uh, and that can be an object that can sometimes be a person that's literally in a shot that can be uh, some kind of a landscape which helps tell a certain story. So it's, we always look at it from a storytelling point of view. And I'll let Gavin chime in as well. Yeah, no, that's pretty much the approach. And with this particular book, like we sort of said the time machine analogy, but we were really looking for different locations that represented what the night sky was like through these different eras. So starting with the native perspective, we shot at the Bodie ghost town in California to sort of show you what an old mining town sky would have been like, and then kind of working our way all the way up to the sort of modern sky where it's blown out what you see here. So in that case, we really were thinking of story and foreground, but also specifically about sort of chronology in a way to try to really represent the arc of time of where it had gone in that sense. But yeah, foreground really is the key. I mean, it's those two elements. It's the, the good sky and also the good foreground because you can shoot a perfect shot of the night sky with no foreground. And it's just something about it, it's just lifeless. It's just, it, just doesn't, it just doesn't have any magic to it. I think largely because you can't sort of picture yourself where you would be in terms of looking up and, and having that perspective. I think that's it. But immediately, even if you just put a signpost or a tent or a car in the foreground it's just it's already kind of telling a story and giving you the sort of perspective and you can feel that sort of axis of the earth as it turns and that and that extent so uh yeah i think that's those are the main things we, we approached sort of it was a good good night sky and then sort of a good foreground element that could set it apart a little bit mm -hmm. and the book that that you had in, in your video um that people can check out at skyglowproject.com you do have such an interesting job of kind of telling the story of light pollution and its evolution and you have some really creative foregrounds i think my favorite might be car hunch oh yeah <laughs> that's the best that a little bit yeah, cool. Carhenge is this, it, in case you don't know, it's this amazing location in Nebraska where this guy essentially decided to recreate Britain's Stonehenge using old abandoned cars. So, and it's pretty, I think it's relatively intact. Like it's, everything's kind of where it's supposed to be, even though it's an old Buick on top of a Chevy and, and uh, it's this absolutely stunning location in the daytime. But then when you go at night, you kind of get this magical feeling to it. It actually has some of that magic of Stonehenge. And, and uh, we went there a couple of times. The, the time I went with Haroon, it was actually this insane lightning storm. And it's one of the videos on our website. But so we were standing there using the cars to sort of shelter ourselves from the rain and trying not to get struck by lightning as lightning was flashing all around us. And, and uh, I was kind of imagining what my epitaph would look like if I had died shooting car hands with this photography stuff. But as much as it was sort of this sort of uh, pop culture jokey kind of thing, what was amazing about it is it did still have that sort of reverence uh, for the sky and it did kind of still have a, a bit of a magic that was there and and what was a kind of really exciting is that Haroon was able to go back because when they had this huge solar eclipse a few years ago as it turned out Carhenge was one of the spots that was actually directly on the line where the total eclipse would occur and so it had you know thousands of people flocked there to sort of witness this sacred event beneath these old cars. And so it was kind of kind of hilarious. There's are 50,000 people in a town of like 5,000. <laughs> yeah, those, those are really fun videos. I'm, I'm <laughs> glad you guys had that experience and were able to share it with others. 
Well, we have time for a couple of questions if people want to post their questions. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, we're monitoring um, the comments. And we have a question here from uh, Lewis um, from Facebook. And he's wondering, what's the best lens for long exposure? And uh, why is it a tilt shift lens? Um, and I think you can see the rest of the question there. How would you incorporate light pollution into an English class through storytelling? So two different questions. Maybe uh, we can we can split that up. Maybe first touch on the equipment question. Yeah, um, go, we, we use a lot of a lot of lenses. We use the uh, the Canon L series lenses. You're really looking for very wide lenses. So I think you know starting probably 24 millimeter and going even wider than that. You're really trying to get as much of the perspective as possible of the sky. And we'll go almost even down to 12 millimeter, which is sort of bordering on a fisheye perspective. Uh, but you are just trying to capture as much as possible of, of the sky that's out there, but at the same time, uh, letting as much light in as possible. We have a few sort of cheaper lenses like the uh, Sam Yang one, which is, again, I think I've got a 12 millimeter, which is really effective. Um, which ones am I missing? It's kind of the L series main. It's mostly L series, some some sigma in there of, I mean, usually you want lenses that are gonna open up a lot, the aperture can open up, and those don't, let's just say, don't tend to be cheap, typically. There's some, like Rokinans, that, that company will have some of that, um, but usually you're having to um, invest in equipment in what's really a, a very expensive hobby uh astrophotography uh and and a difficult one because you have to obviously find the spots and then use these lenses and try not to trip all over yourself and break everything at night um so th that yeah i would say i would my answer would be wide lenses but you can also use longer lenses to do astrophotography um they may require additional equipment like you may need to mount um it on some kind of a tracking mechanism because um, when you're doing long exposures you're at least doing 15 to 30 seconds and when the lens is too long, the stars are moving too quickly. They start uh, trailing across the sky to, you know, uh, uh, before the image is even done. So you may need to actually have a tracking mechanism, unlike not unlike one that's on on a telescope, for example. Yeah. One of the things uh, that I I did a little bit in the early days was you can actually rent lenses as well. I think uh, borrowlenses.com, and it's relatively affordable to sort of try one out for a week. And that's something I would recommend as well if you're kind of just getting into the hobby. You know, try it out, experience it, ex you know, experiment with sort of what works for you and doesn't work. And But what you'll find is that the lenses are almost as important as the camera, if not more than the camera. And in some cases, the lenses are more expensive than the camera too so you are looking for that You're, you don't want to screw around really with the lenses you want to really have the kind of good glass and the, the fast speed and enough that can really capture it because it is it's hard work kind of getting out there to these locations as Haroon said and and you know you want to have everything working for you because there's so many elements that can go wrong the wind can blow it or the clouds can come over or you know so on and so on and so on an animal can walk through and block the shot or we've had just about everything's happened in some of these experiences but but the lenses are, are worth it and uh, renting them kind of gives you that peace of mind that it's worthwhile but but yeah, there are some affordable ones. Yeah, it's the Rokinon and the Samyang are kind of the cheaper ones that still give us a pretty good output. But the real kind of gold standard for us is probably these L-series Canon ones. Um, I use the 24 millimeter 1.4 that is pretty effective. Um, and yeah, but that's, that's definitely the trial and error of borrowing them is helpful too. Gavin, I know you spend some time in your uh, <laughs> day job um, doing write, a lot of writing. Um, and I wonder if you want to take a stab at the second part of that question about incorporating light pollution into an English class through storytelling. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's, it, I mean, first of all, Haroon's the professor, so he's probably better than I am at this. But it's, I think like, if anything, what we found in, in the project was just, it was constant where we found these incredible stories, you know, largely starting with sort of the native perspective and their mythologies that would all kind of rotate around this night sky elements. And so there's that version of it right there. I mean, uh, but we also found that there were other elements too that you could approach like uh, in terms of the early ships coming to American shores and using celestial navigation. And, uh, and sort of, so it's interesting. It kind of just, it says a lot about the culture in terms of 
what the sky means to them and starting with the natives where it kind of was used as every part of the cultural mythology and then working all the way up to where we are now where it is this sort of forgotten treasure kind of that we're which says a lot about where we are but if anything this kind of current situation is hopefully helping us kind of take a another look at some of the things that we had sort of forgotten about and some of the things that used to be important to us. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of an actual lesson, I don't know, I'm trying to think. I mean, I think that you could certainly do a fair amount on actual stories and actual mythologies that exist about the night sky. Um, I'm not sure if you know, get people to create new ones, I and mean, that might be interesting, you know? How do you sort of take today's society and what would today's mythology look like with the night sky? And if you had to write write one today, maybe how would you incorporate what we know about the culture and, and the night sky? Harun, what am I missing? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, th there is a way, obviously, of talking about it in the present. I think to some extent that's in uh, Paul Bogart's book. Uh, I think he does some of that, which is more like reflections on current states and his experience, obviously, of seeing the night sky, you know, in its pristine form compared to when you're at home. And I think you could do some of that in certain places, which you can get people to sort of do writing on contrasts of, of, you know, our usual urban environments or just living environments, even in rural areas, they're overlit. <clears throat> and then what it means to venture out into the darkness. So there's ways of kind of reflecting upon those experiences in the present as well. Uh, the problem is, as I said, is for most people, it's very hard for them to get to a good night sky spot in order to have that experience, in order to be able to reflect um because it's too, so far away from the cities usually and if you live on the east coast of america you may have to have a long long journey um in order to see a pristine night sky so that's the unfortunate part is that it's very hard to get people to have that contrasting experience well if people are looking for inspiration sky glow project is a great place to start and simulate that experience we also um you mentioned paul bogart author of the end of night he did a reading from his book for international dark sky week and that is available on our website so you could go and check out um him reading an excerpt from his book at idsw.darksky.org um yeah Harun, let's uh <laughs> ask this question to you first um maybe we'll we'll do this and one more question and then close it out mm -hmm. what drives you to do the work that you do um so i, I love uh environmental documentary in general I, I just think it's the most important thing we're facing on a planet at the moment starting with obviously climate change is is, is the largest issue there but there's a general problem of humans being in one way or another damaging to the environment or being di distanced from the environment like the the nature isn't part of our daily lives and that's going to have uh, pretty severe consequences in different ways and light pollution is one of those consequences obviously there's much more deadly ones coming to us uh, potentially so I, I just thought that that kind of work and getting that into the public consciousness and doing films uh, any kind of uh, work about it is very important because um I don't know that we're going to be around too much longer the way we're living. Um, so we have to come to terms with that, that, that things aren't going too well. Mm. Yeah. Gavin, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it all sort of started by accident for us, really. It was something where Harun and I had gone to film school together, and we really were just doing this for creativity and to kind of escape the crush of living in a big city. And so it started just with this sort of personal relief of kind of getting out and being creative and getting under the night sky. But as we sort of got going and it became more of an activism kind of thing, we, I, if anything for me, it was sort of this re realization that the people at the Dark Sky uh, Association and all these chapter heads and the more people we met as we did these different events across the country, we just saw there was these real selfless people that were getting out there and knocking on doors and saying you know how do we can we change your light bulb for free and can we make you aware of some of the things you can do not only to save money for your town but also to sort of make it a more appealing landscape and so forth so i think we're yeah it all started really just for the creativity of it all but then by the time we kind of kept going we were really motivated by just the dark sky association and all the people that are actually out there really rolling up their sleeves to make a difference. And what we do is the easy part. We kind of just 
take the pictures and try to put them up on the internet and so forth. But the ones that are really out there trying to change minds from one little town at a time are, are the ones that really inspire us, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, if you're just tuning in, we're here with Gavin Heffernan from Skyglow. We had Harun Madinovich with us. Maybe he'll be able to come back. Um, seems like he had some trouble with his connection. And mm -hmm. um, Gavin, maybe I'll just close out with one final question. You and Harun have traveled all across the country sharing um, Skyglow project with, with people. Um, and you have some really, really great stories about the, the photography that you've captured and the experiences that you've had. Can you just close this out with maybe your most inspiring moment under the night sky? Okay, uh, that's a tough one. I mean, there, there's been a lot, you know, there's a, a lot of kind of magical moments. I, I know, you know, Harun has a few as well. I mean, for me, it's it's a simple one, but it was just sort of being in Death Valley. There's this, this part of Death Valley that's with the Eureka Dunes, and uh, it's kind of like these 6,000 feet tall dunes, and, and we went out there in December, and it was just kind of like there's nobody around for almost 100 miles, it seemed like. And being up there, it was just so quiet, and it's almost like snow where it absorbs all the sound. and it really felt like you could close your eyes and just imagine that you were on another planet, like you really were on Mars or something. And I know there was just something very simple and magical about that that I think was really transformative and de-stressing. And then the very next morning we woke up, uh, like an F-16 fighter pilot came flying over, like you could hear it about 10 seconds before you could see it. And the thing just came over. I guess they do their tests in this area, and the guy it was so low I could see the guy's helmet, and like I could see his head bobbing around, and the thing. And so it was kind of a, in one night, you'd gone from this completely otherworldly experience to you know a, a fighter pilot flying about a hundred feet over your head. And so there was something really magical about that, and then just that it was that sort of transformative experience and sort of. I think at the time was just a stressful time with work in the city and then suddenly four or five hours drive away and it was like being transported to another planet. And uh, so that was one of the ones that I remember a lot. I'm sure Haroon has a favorite night sky uh, adventure that he had if he wasn't getting arrested or handcuffed or one of the other ones. He's had some more exciting ones than I have. A gun? There was a guy with a gun, right? Uh, somewhere. I, I think like the, I think astrophotography is a very privileged space and what I mean by that is it takes a lot of money to do it it takes a lot of money to travel and also you're in the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere and I as a dude and I happen to be a white dude I can get away with a lot <laughs> um, in that sort of a situation with many other people um, if you're a woman out in the darkness uh, there is definitely a larger sense of danger in a place like that. If you're somebody who's non-white, if you happen to be waltzing around to take some shots and you walk into somebody's backyard out in the rural America, um, these are the kind of things that really we ought to kind of recognize that we can do some of these things because we can do them. Mm -hmm. um, and they are much harder for other people to do and they're very dangerous in some cases for other people to do. So <clears throat> I just wanted to make that point. Because I think it is an important one, because people often tell me, why aren't there many women in astrophotography? Well, I can tell you, a good part of that is it's not very safe to do, or at least it's not very safe to the mind, the concept of actually go going out into darkness. Now, in many places, it's not as dangerous as it seems, but the potential of something dangerous happening is there. And, and certainly the few times that I've been out there when there's something that could have developed as a dangerous situation, maybe the dynamics would have been different if I was somebody else. Yeah, that's a really important point about access to the night sky. You know, Gavin mentioned this transformative experience that mm -hmm. not everyone has access to, and it's something that's really important to IDA as an organization, um, designating international dark sky places mm -hmm. and um, inviting national parks and other land managers to open their space at night in ways that are accessible and safe for people is a really important part of that program. So I certainly appreciate you bringing that up and it's something that we all could be thinking a lot more about, you know, the other half of the day is the night and it's something that touches us really deeply and not everyone does have access to it. And we all can play a part in making sure that it's something that's a little more accessible to everyone.
And I think it would help if, if you know, obviously people that can access it to give access to others, to help others come along and see it. I've, I've certainly tried to do that when somebody wanted to go out and see the night sky. When I'm going out there, I try to get people to tag along sometimes to be able to see it because they might not ever get to see it on their own. Uh -huh. um, so that's important. If you have an opportunity to do that, I would highly encourage you to do that. And there are programs to help that. I think there's in Charlottesville, there's a program which gets kids out right from school or from university i want to say it out to like the rural parts of virginia in order to see the night skies and there's programs that help people do that and obviously uh maybe tagging along with your local astronomy clubs in different places they could they could help you have that experience because they'll bring their big telescope and they'll take them to the best night night sky spot in in the general area sometimes it's a bit of a drive i know in this area it's often you're driving five hours to west virginia um to have that experience and so on but that might be a way if you can join one of those clubs, there may be a ways of somebody else helping you get to these places. Sometimes when you aren't able to yourself, um, but that, that'd be my suggestion. And yeah, as far as the stories, there's billions of stories and um, I'm sure you can find them out there. We've done qu quite a bit of interviews about weird experiences we've had <laughs> shooting this stuff, including running into people with guns. That happens. Um, <laughs> that's why I said it, it can be very really tricky because you're out there walking in the dark or you're accessing very remote areas and there's some people there that don't want you around necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to have a good excuse when you show up. Uh, like me, when I showed up to Cerro Gordo, which is a dark sky, a great dark sky area, but it's a ghost town that's privately owned. And the guy greeted me with a shotgun and said, like, what are you doing up here? <laughs> um, like get off the mountain. And then I tried, I had to explain to him, you know, it's, I don't have any bad intentions. I'm here to um, actually photograph. And he said, what, what do you want to photograph? And I said, I want to photograph at night, actually. I don't want to photograph ghost town during the day. And he's like, why the heck would you do that? You can't see your hand in front of your face. And I was like, that's the point. Like <laughs> you can see the stars. And, and it was really funny seeing his response. He was like, oh, oh, I never thought about that. Yeah, I guess you can see the stars, and I, I thought that was a good lesson for all of us as to how we lost the night sky because we took it for granted, and he takes it for granted, so he's like, oh, it's a night sky. Mm. And I'm like, it's not just, oh, it's the night sky. It's like very rare, good yeah. quality night sky, and he was kind of blown away, and here's a guy that lives in that area, and he's like, oh, I never really thought about it that way, uh, mm. but now I'm thinking about it that way. Now I'm like uh, more appreciative. Well, thank you for helping him think about it that way and be appreciative of it and helping people all over the world think about this resource and for putting life and limb in danger to <laughs> capture those beautiful photographs and sharing it with people. Mm -hmm. um, if people have questions for you later, how can they reach you? Is there a way for them to, to interact with you outside of this broadcast? Yep, probably the website is, uh, it, you can contact us through skyglowproject.com. We also have a Facebook page, which you can click. It's just Skyglow Facebook. You'll find it that way. And, uh, yeah, we got tons more videos and tons more stuff that we sort of discovered along the way. So these are just three little samples. But there's a lot out there and uh, a lot of fun things. And if you want to go even bigger, the book really helps support us and helps kind of keep us in the sort of night sky game. And, uh that's kind of a fun thing if you're hunkered down in this lockdown, but there's tons of free content out there as well on the website. So yeah, dive in and, and just sort of, it's the kind of thing, feel free to share it and uh, bring other people into the fold. And, and uh, the IDA is a great opportunity to do that as well. And there's a lot of little things you can do. It's, it's unlike a lot of things where it's this huge, massively complicated thing to change. You can actually make a pretty big difference just from your front porch and uh, your school and the little little grocery store. And there's some of those little things that seem small actually can make a really big difference when you get a few people together doing it as one group. So, so yeah, have faith and there is a lot that can be done. We've come a long way and there's, there's hope that we can do better moving forward. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for bringing up the ways that individuals can make a difference. It is true that every little bit makes a difference. And if you're interested in figuring out how to make a difference from your front porch, you can go to idsw.darksky.org. There's an activities tab, which includes a home lighting certification program. So you can check out, compare the lights around your home to dark sky friendly lights and see if your home is dark sky friendly and make some really simple changes to help protect the night where you live. Um, please go check out Sky Glow Project. <laughs> the book if you're interested check out the videos it's a really amazing project and we hope you'll support it um gavin and haroon thank you so much for being here with us today we thanks really for having us thanks everybody
Okay. Well, okay. enjoy um, International Dark Sky Week. We'll look up together and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Bye-bye. Okay.